As described in the fourth chapter, the Parampara system of the Sutra succession for the understanding of Bhagavad Gita was lost. And therefore, Krishna re-established that disciplic succession with Arjuna because he considered Arjuna his intimate friend and a great devotee. Therefore, as stated in our introduction to Gita Upanishad, Bhagavad Gita should be understood in the Parampara system. When the Parampara system was lost, Arjuna was selected to rejuvenate it. The acceptance by Arjuna of all that Krishna says should be emulated. Then we can understand the essence of Bhagavad Gita. And then only can we understand that Krishna is the Supreme Personality of Godhead. Uh, so Arjuna is saying, I totally accept this truth, all that you have said. Um, and neither the demigods nor the demons can understand your personality. So th this comes at, at the 10th chapter of Bhagavad Gita. And it's very interesting how Arjuna's uh, perspective changes through the course of the Gita. Have you noticed that? He starts off very confident. How confident is Arjuna when he, at, at the beginning of Bhagavad Gita? He's so confident that he does what? He presents very nice arguments to Krishna why he should not find it. Before that, very first thing. Sena yor ubayor madye, says to Krishna. Says, drive my chariot between the arms. Oh, yeah. He's very confident, isn't he? He's telling God, drive my chariot between the arms. <laughs> He's very confident. And then he melts down and has, mm -hmm. has all of these uh, apprehensions and makes all of these arguments. And then he, so he becomes, he goes from very confident to exasperated to completely to, distraught within just a few minutes. And then he says, now Krishna, I am the soul surrendered to you, please instruct me. <coughs> now I am, your, I am your disciple. So this is yet another change. Mm -hmm. So then Krishna begins instructing him. And then Arjuna is very human in his responses you know, to Krishna's instructions. You know what I mean? I, I mean, he, he's, um, he's questioning Krishna quite, uh, quite vigorously. Can anyone remember some of the questions, kind of penetrating questions that Arjuna asks Krishna? I'll say okay. control the mind. Yeah? Mm -hmm. But I, I'm a little more, more like skeptical in chapter three. He doesn't want to fight the, the relatives on the other side. He doesn't want to fight the relatives. So what good would the king of the yeah? yeah. And then in chapter, so then at the end of chapter 2, Krishna explains how to be a yogi. And then at the beginning of chapter 3, Krishna, Arjuna asks a very skeptical question. You're telling me to fight this, to be a yogi, to be detached, and you're telling me to fight this terrible war. Would you please explain these equivocal instructions? Mm -hmm. Chapter 3 and chapter 5, similar questions. So he's, he's, at, he's not just accepting it completely by any means. Then in chapter 4, he, he asked yet another very skeptical question. So Krishna says, I've been teaching the science of yoga from time immemorial to the sun god, and now today I'm instructing it to you because you're my devotee and my friend. And now, how is that possible? And how is it possible? <laughs> <laughs> the sun god is so much older than you. <laughs> how could you have instructed him way back then? See, these are such nice real questions, you know. It, it takes a while for Arjuna to come to this point <coughs> where he totally accepts everything. It's actually in that verse where Krishna first <coughs> reveals his divinity. He says, many births, Bahumi Chuti Matitani, Many births you and I have passed. I can remember all of them, but you cannot. <clears throat> Up to that point, Krishna has been a friend. <coughs> he has been uh, an instructor, but now all of a sudden Krishna's in a whole different echelon. He can remember all of his births. So then Arjuna begins <coughs> to ask 
like in chapter 8, you just ask, all right, well then tell me about karma, tell me about the soul, tell me about <coughs> uh, this material world. And all of these questions just lay down in chapter 8. And then Krishna explains, answers them all. And then in chapter 9 he goes a little more intimate, becomes a little more intimate. You know, the most confidential knowledge, he says, um, Bhatrim Pushpam Palam Toya. If you just offer me the <coughs> simple fruit, flower, leaf, or water, I will accept it. It's interesting, you know, the order of those items, those articles, Bhatrim Pushpam Palam Toya. Uh, so what comes out in the spring? In the spring. It's, oh, you're in this, like, say, up north. The leaf. Right. Mm -hmm. And then uh, in the summer, wow. the flower. And then in the fall, the fruit. Right. And then when all the leaves and flowers and fruits are gone, you can still get some water and you can melt some snow. <laughs> so, uh, any season of the year, no excuse, any, any time of the year, you can offer these simple things. And Krishna says, if you offer them with love, I will accept them. So, at that point, Krishna has shown Arjuna not only his supremacy, but how to interact with him in a loving relationship. Nitya Yukta Upasate. So now, in chapter 10, Arjuna is finally convinced. See, that's why this verse is very important. I totally accept this truth all that you've told. No more questions now. Now, it's, it's funny that he says this, and yet, but what are the last six chapters of the Gita about? Modes of nature. Yeah, well, you know, there's the first six are about what kind of yoga? You heard this? Uh, it's the, the uh, karma yoga. Karma, yeah. The middle six are about bhakti, and the last six are about jnana. Yeah. It's yeah. all about yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. the, the modes of nature, mm -hmm. nature to enjoy your consciousness, yoga mm -hmm. is in person. So, so uh, it's like a sandwich. Describe that the, the real content is in the middle and that is protected on either side. Mm -hmm. So uh, this is the bhakti section. And later I'm going to ask so many more questions. Mm -hmm. So even though he's convinced, he's, he's probing the subject very deeply in, in these last six chapters. Mm -hmm. uh, so anyway, the point is that Arjuna is at this tipping point where he's now become completely convinced. Um, so how does that relate? Can anyone share, like, when they became completely convinced about Krishna consciousness? How does it relate? Can we share? Can, can anyone, yeah. When did you become completely convinced? I mean, were you just born that way? Did you <laughs> when walk in the temple, were you totally convinced? Um, when I was a hippie, we were reading all kinds of um, books, you know, that were supposedly about Eastern philosophy, like The Master Game and Be Here Now, and, um, but when I got Shri Prabhupada's Bhagavad Gita as it is, I didn't give him a devotee, I got an adult bookseller, and um, I, I guess I was on some search, but as I read page after page, I just felt like, <laughs> I found it, this is it. Oh, wow. Mm -hmm. So that's all it took for you, it was amazing. Again. Mm, I don't know, desperation. <laughs> well, I read these the hippie books too, and my, my first book was the Isha Upanishad. I could not understand. It. I couldn't understand it, but I knew that it was the truth. You just intuitively understand. And for me, it took a few months of prasad. <laughs> <laughs> Anyone else? How, how did you become convinced? You know, what was your conversion experience? Uh, gradual process. <laughs> <laughs> but actually, it's funny you, you asked the question because uh, when Shula Prabhupada was in New Orleans, I, I had the opportunity to ask him a number of questions. Uh -huh. And one of the questions that I asked him was using this word, uh, because I, coming from a Catholic background, I was going to church on a Sunday morning, I'd go to the temple on a Sunday afternoon. And I wouldn't say it was a conflict because I really felt Lord Jesus helped bring me to Krishna consciousness. But my mind was of how to 
make the whole world Christian conscious and how to convince the, the Catholic Church and the bishops and the hierarchy of the Catholic Church to accept Christian consciousness. So I asked Philip Prabhupada this question. I said, in, in this light, I was asking them, how do you convince the bishops, you know, they meet, they do so many things. How do you convince? He cut me off real quick. He said, first you become convinced. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. that always stuck with me. And I saw, mm -hmm. I, I think it was at that moment that I became more convinced. I knew I had to become more convinced of surrendering, surrendering to Krishna and mm -hmm. accepting the philosophy. Oh, I see. You know, charity begins at home. Huh? Yes. <laughs> that reminds me of a great sense of what Arch tells about the being with Srila Prabhupada. In some GDC meeting or something, Prabhupada addressed all of his disciples. He said, Are you convinced? Hmm. And Sets of Maharaj said that nobody said a, a word. It felt like if they'd said anything, it would have been some like, Yes, Srila Prabhupada. <laughs> <laughs> I just read that in uh, Chang Sundar's book, uh, Second Bound. Uh -huh. Are you convinced? No one said it. And then he said, unless you're convinced, you cannot help me spread this movement all over the world. Who were you, uh, when you said that, also it recalled in my mind, uh, Andrew Unit Maharaj tells a story, I believe it was in France. There was a lecture anyway, a lot of godfathers were there. And every godfather seemed to remember this one point, one point in the lecture where Prabhupada said, please believe me when I say you're not this body. He was really begging, me, please believe me when I, when I tell you you're not this body. So that's just another thing we have to become convinced of, that we're not these bodies. You know, this uh, process of bhakti has these nine progressive development stages, you know, beginning with Sandal, Shraddha, preliminary faith, and then what comes next? Preliminary faith leads one to what? Uh, not quite. There's one in between. But we were a little faithful and we will eventually get the what? Association of devotees, the Sadhu Sangha. Mm -hmm. And then from Sadhu Sangha we get Vajna Kriya, we get regulated practice of bhakti, which leads us to what's next? That's a strong, strong. Uh, that's one more. That's interesting. Vajna Kriya. Vajna Kriya, yes. The, the experience of losing attachments to material desires is a profound and almost unexpected consequence of chanting and hearing. Mm. It's, when that happens, it's such a such an eye opener that one becomes convinced on a very deep level. It's like um, when when you're eating enough prasad, nobody has to tell you, okay, you're full. You know, you know it, you feel it. You don't have to be monitored. So in the same way, uh, nartanavritti leads to nishta. Mm -hmm. Nishta means unshakable faith, mm -hmm. conviction. So that nishta is like the tipping point in our spiritual practices, because after that, after nishta comes uh, ruchi and asakti, uh, intense attachment, taste, attachment, uh, then bhava, preliminary love of God, and then finally prema, ecstatic love of God. So everything after nishta is just into the very sweet side of things. Mm -hmm. So this uh, nishta is really the, the tipping point between the Kanishka and the Madhyama Adhikara. You know, the Kanishka or beginning. Like Kanishka means without Nishka, you know. Mm -hmm. Kanishka, without, without firm faith. So the Kanishka uh, is then progresses itself. Um, well, who, who can remember? What are the characteristics of the Kanishka? Some of the characteristics. They, they can appreciate that the Lord is present within the deity, but they, it doesn't go much farther than that. Yes, yeah, so remember Krishna in the temple, but when they leave the temple, they forget all of that. Let's say, what, what's another characteristic? How about in terms of interpersonal relationships? We can distinguish the difference between 
Yes. They, they cannot discriminate or distinguish the difference between different types of people. They can't tell who's good association, who's bad association. Uh, so they will easily get influenced by bad association. They don't appreciate the value. Kanisha doesn't appreciate the value of associating with the voters. So as a result, they are, uh, if they're presented with counter arguments to Krishna consciousness, they neither have the faith nor the knowledge to defeat those arguments. So they can be easily swayed. Mm. So that's the Kanisha. And the, but the Madhima, uh, first of all, thinks of Krishna everywhere, sees Krishna everywhere, and distinguishes the, the uh, envious, the innocent, and the devotees. So he avoids the envious, he teaches the innocent, and he befriends the devotees. And then the Kanishka may lack, excuse me, Madhya may lack knowledge to defeat opposing arguments, but still will not lose faith. That's Nishta. So this is the Madhya Adhika. So the, uh, the point of conviction, this is why Prabhupada is making these statements, unless you have this conviction, you can't help me. You can't help me if you're a, a, a condition. You have to have a firm faith. So in our, in our spiritual journey, this is the first real profound uh, junction between Kanishta and Madhyama. And then beyond Madhyama is the what? Uttama. Uttama Now, here, here's one of the very big conundrums we have in this one. How do you recognize an Uttama Adhikar? Mm. Right. Um, one, one of the boys suggested that we should invent an utometer, <laughs> a Geiger counter, which <laughs> you can just tell. But um, in one place in the Shastra it said that only one, one Uttamahanakar can recognize another Uttamahanakar. Yeah. Yeah. But um, the Uttamahanakar is unable to distinguish, like the Kanishka, because the Uttamahari Fire sees everyone is more advanced than me. That profound humility is the distinguishing characteristic. And it's, it's not something that can be imitated, but it is a consequence of advancement in Krishna consciousness. Mm -hmm. uh, there was a great story about Duryodhana, I, I mean, uh, yeah, Duryodhana, I know. And uh, yes. Drona, mm -hmm. yeah, Drona was testing Duryodhana and Yudhisthira. Mm -hmm. So he said to Duryodhana, go find somebody who is superior to you. Mm -hmm. He said to you, just turn, you go find someone who is inferior to you. And uh, both of them went out all day, and they both came back empty handed. Mm -hmm. And just said, well, yes, I saw a man hitting a cow. And I thought, okay, here's somebody who's inferior to me. So then I followed him home, and I looked in his window, and I saw his wife was feeding him a kadashi prasadam. So he was honoring the class the idea, and he said, no, no, he's my superior. So they both came back empty handed and the Yoda and I, and, and uh, Drona said, you uh, here, you are fit to rule the world, and the Yoda and I, you are fit to be eaten by chattels. <laughs> so to, to, you really chastised the ability of a guru, but you haven't seen the same thing. <laughs> <Didn't see the laughs> <laughs> That's one of the <laughs> qualities of the narcissist, isn't it? <laughs> Nobody is superior to me. <laughs> In chapter 16, right? Ishwaram Mahambhogi Sam Siddhim Balamam Suki. I am the controller, I am the enjoyer, I am a perfect, powerful man. Mm -hmm. So the, uh, the Uttama is so much the opposite. Mm -hmm. Saying, oh, this person is my superior. Um, Donegar Maharaj used to teach us how in, in uh, recruiting devotees, he said, always look for the way that this person is superior to you. If they're more educated, if they're older, if they're younger, if they're uh, more accomplished, and find some way in which they're your superior and then recognize that. Whereas a Mayavadi uh, sannyasi who was coming around the uh, ashram there in Los Angeles, and he was a little interested. So he came up to see, see uh, Donavir uh, Maharaj's office. Donavir was a brahmachari at that time. And as soon as he came in, Donavir stood up. 
that was me. And, and, and the man was a little surprised. He said, that's how we treat sannyasis around here. Mm -hmm. Sannyasi was Amala Bhatta. Oh, really? Yeah, that's, that's how he became mm -hmm. the most. <laughs> so, uh, the Uttama Adhikari, always seeing others as superior, uh, this, the bhajans of the acharyas express this in very heartfelt ways, you know, very, very mm -hmm. uh, heart wrenching ways. So, like Bhakti Nanda Thakur says, when I see others happy, I feel unhappy. And when I see others unhappy, I feel happy. Mm -hmm. Describing his own heart. And, you know, we can't really fathom how, are they just saying this for our benefit? Mm -hmm. Are they just saying this because this is how you should be thinking? Sometimes we look at it that way. But another way to look at it is they are expressing what they're perceiving in their own hearts and minds. They're not affected by it, but they're recognized and they're sharing very intimately. Is that also a attainable quality when you when this goes on? Because you want to get on that same platform. Is, is that you know something that's an aspiration, or is that just no? I mean, how's that how's that to be you know taken and understood by someone who's really on a lower platform? It's like a uh, signpost on the highway. You know, when you see whatever Biloxi, fifty miles, you're not in Biloxi, but you know you're on the road to Biloxi. Gotcha. So, okay, I don't, I'm not there yet, but I'm going in the right direction. And when I see these qualities in myself, then I know I'm getting closer to the destination. And you see someone, you say, what do you say? When I see someone distressed, I'm happy? Yes. That's just one. There's so many places where they just condemn themselves. My, my heart is so full of material desires. Uh, I'm always envious, you know. They, 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 you know what I'm talking about? Narasim Das and Bhakti Vinod Thakur. So you're making himself sound like a bad guy, but he's yeah. talking about his mind. He's right. They're, they're completely detached from their mind and heart and senses, but that's what they're seeing. You know, self-realization. It's not a pretty picture, necessarily. Mm -hmm. But to see one's own fault. In fact, Prabhupada writes that the, uh, the servants of the Lord are always overwhelmed by the task of researching the truth and in seeing their own faults they become oblivious to the faults of others. Their own faults become so prominent mm. that they don't see faults in other people. Mm. So this is the Uttama Adhikari. Therefore it's for the Uttama Adhikari to preach they have to do what? Come down to a level of, of the uh, yes. personal. Again discriminating. <clears throat> the, the Kanishka can't discriminate the Uttama can't discriminate. It's only the Madhyama that discriminate. In Los Angeles, our Sankirtan leader on Saturday used to come around. Uh, <clears throat> Prabhu, could you descend to the second class platform today for <laughs> <go> distribution? <laughs> <laughs> so these are some points. Any other topics for discussion from, from this? How Arjuna is now at this point of Nishta. Any other thoughts? I was thinking how, uh, you know, at least myself, I, I always see a Junin's greatness. You know, he's a warrior and he's a devotee. But, you know, when you when you read this verse today in Srila Prabhupada's purport, I just got a glimpse of his greatness that although he's a country in a time where people were born in these designations purely without ever conflicting modes. He was a pure country, mm -hmm. a protector of people, a governor, mm -hmm. administrator. But Krishna chose him to receive the Bhagavad Gita mm -hmm. again instead of a Brahman. Mm -hmm. So that, that was, I, I really was, am amazed by that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> yeah, this, this is a, a theme that uh, has been a constant issue in ISKCON since its inception. Mm -hmm. okay. Is this knowledge meant only for those who are born in exalted Brahman families, or is it meant for everybody? Mm -hmm. And uh, it, there's a bit of entitlement. You know, if one has an auspicious birth in a Brahman family and so forth, you want to protect your turf. <laughs> it's, it's only for us. Mm -hmm. Maybe next lifetime you could be one of mm -hmm. us. 
<laughs> so, yeah. Prabhupada stresses so much that uh, Sriya Vaishnas, Tatasvi, Dostati, Prabhupada, anyone, regardless of their birth, can attain the Supreme Destination. They, uh, mm. There's still, and it still goes on, you know, to this day. It's like, you know, just, just cantilated a lot of it. India at this time is just booming. And America is on is struggling. And, and sometimes the devotees in India look at America and think, oh, well, if you could just be more rabbinical, more Vedic, you know, then, then you would have this struggle, you'd be, you'd be expanding like us. But the, the problem is that uh, <clears throat> it, it, the markets are entirely different. Yeah, there's no Vedic heritage. He is a Christian heritage. Exactly. So you have to do a lot <laughs> to, to bring somebody to Christian consciousness. So in, in Gainesville, we found that the Christian house, the more we reduce the cultural hurdles, hmm. just make it easy. And the first generation of devotees Prabhupada brought in, you know, there were no, first there were no cultural uh, obstacles for them, you know, no cultural obligations. Do you want to be initiated? Yeah, sure. And uh, <laughs> then the next, the day after the initiation, he said, one of the disciples asked, are there any rules now that we're initiated? <laughs> 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 to which Robin said, I'm very glad you were asking that question. <laughs> so, so first there was the relationship and the affection and the encouragement. You know, all of that preceded the rules of regulation. But then we kind of got advanced and we got more and more rules and regulations. Everybody came back from India, oh, you have to do this, you have to do that. Um, particularly the impact of the women. Women have to put the ups to the back, you have to do this. And, and, and uh, more and more women became marginalized. And it was all like a saffron 70s. And we mm -hmm. probably left. So we kind of got frozen in time at that point. But uh, before that, the really good old days, it was very egalitarian in the late 60s and early 70s. The ashrams were very uh, family-like. People were treated with, everyone was welcomed and, and respected and appreciated. We didn't have elders, you know, we didn't have wise guidance, but at least everybody was just accepted on an equal platform. So that kind of shifted, <clears throat> but you know, it, it's, um, the whole premise of the Sankirtan movement is that we are not these bodies, that whatever designations we are, you know, Chaitriya Vaishnava, Vaishya Sudra, Brahman, those are, those are uh, secondary. I was just reading this very interesting letter from Srila Prabhupada, very strong letter. He said, always remember, always remember that Varnashram is good for the materialists and it can be helpful for the devotees but spiritual life is not dependent on it. Mm -hmm. Very strongly said that. Spiritual life is not dependent on it. Actually, Abhiram Prabhu told me, he was Prabhupada's nurse in this last few months with us physically and uh, so when Prabhupada wanted to establish Varnashram, <coughs> call it 50% of his mission, mm -hmm. he was saying his concern was he was seeing all these brahmacharis like shooting stars. You know, they, they do books, be real fired up, and then they fall down. And he, he wanted to establish a sustainable way of life for these disciples so that they could stay in Krishna consciousness. He wanted them to live off the land and, and uh, you know, be able to be sustenance farmers. Mm -hmm. In Alachua, living off the land means having a mobile home. <laughs> but the point is, his uh, emphasis on Varnashram was not to impose it on the devotees, because the whole point is to become a devotee. Varnashram can help you become a devotee, but if you're already a devotee, then Varnashram is a secondary consideration. But, you know, especially here in the form, you know, we have, you know, we get, um, you know, so many leaders in the International Society for Krishna Consciousness that specifically see that 
that is uh, um, Prabhupada's mission now to establish Von Ashram in ISKCON. Mm -hmm. And uh, there's quite an emphasis put on it. At the same time, um, how does, at the same time, when Prabhupada was here, the um, um, American ladies went to India and they also got a glimpse that, ooh, it's different in India. Mm -hmm. And Prabhupada had to acknowledge that. Mm -hmm. And, you know, America, America ran one way and India ran directly under Srila mm -hmm. Prabhupada dealing with the Indian heritage. Mm -hmm. so I don't know, what do, you, what do you think about all that? You know, uh, in, in Prabhupada's writings, a lot of the really matured uh, realizations he had about his mission were in the Chaitanya Charitamrita. Mm -hmm. you know, this is where kind of the rubber meets the road and these purports. And in one of them he writes how uh, you cannot suddenly impose the cultural norms of one society on another. Mm -hmm. uh, so, yes, India runs one way, America runs another way, that's true. Uh, so the question then is what works? Like mm -hmm. you said, where there's a very Vedic heritage, you can emphasize these things and people relate to them. But where there is none, we have to get to that later. Rupa Goswami said, Yena Tena Prakarina Mani Krishna Deshaya. Somehow or other, think about Krishna. Rules and regulations can come it. Even concerning something like dress? Yeah, it's you know, the, the um, early days, thinking of, thinking of the early days. You know, Prabhupada didn't require the devotees to change their dress. But he did want them to dress nicely and not regularly. Yes. He did. And, you know, he got them started, and then he gradually mm -hmm. raised his hand. And he praised them for you know, dressing in Vaishnava clothes. He appreciated that. But it wasn't a condition for being a devotee. And so that's my point. Uh, so we get back to the making it easier for people. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and sometimes I think it's a little <clears throat> overemphasized. We've got to be pukka this and pukka that, and I'm off from this and Vedic that. Mm -hmm. you know, okay, 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 but what about the new person? That, that, that will make the new person look at this kind of like, oh, this is not for me. Mm -hmm. What do you think? Uh, Prabhu, uh, could you talk a little bit about also, in, in Srila Prabhupada's books, he's sometimes very strict and rigid in his points. Mm -hmm. But pragmatically, in dealing with his disciples, he was sometimes completely opposite. Yes. I mean, <coughs> you know, what, what he may have could even say contradicted points he made in his books by keeping his disciples in the right direction, mm -hmm. keeping them engaged in Christian consciousness. He would lovingly do the needful mm -hmm. for that. So could you speak a little bit about that contrast? Yes. His Prabhupada's books are like a drugstore. So when you, when you go in the drugstore, you've got a certain ailment, and you just grab, oh, this looks good, I'll try that. You, know? you need the help of an expert physician to make sure we get the right medication for our particular disease. And sometimes medications are said to counteract each other, you know, don't take this if you're taking that. Right? Mm -hmm. So a particular prescription has to be given to the patient according to the patient's need. So similarly, we, we just take that statements from Prabhupada's books here or there, and they, they don't necessarily apply to a particular situation. Uh, this requires some application of, of intelligence, you know, to, to understand the, the whole spectrum of instructions and see what, a, what, will, what will work effectively in a particular situation. So, uh, one of the scholars who studies this kind of was saying that Srila Prabhupada is one of the most do best documented figures in religious history. And this is a big problem. Mm. <laughs> because he says this over here and that over here. And so you can find so many apparent contradictions. Mm. So this is this is why Rupa Goswami writes that uh, you know the first rule is always remember Krishna and never forget Krishna. And all the other rules and regulations are subordinate to that. So uh, for people with particular needs, particular instructions are there. And, and, and uh, fanaticism, 
means to take something out of, just out of context and insist that this detail is now a principle. And if we don't follow this detail, then we're violating the principles of Christian consciousness. Mm -hmm. Really, the principles are very few. Right? Just four regular principles, chant Hare Krishna, and uh, uh, three non pcdj you know, treating devotees properly and others properly. But beyond that, everything is more or less a detail. So we have to be intelligent enough to see what details are appropriate for this particular circumstance. If we can't find any reference in Prabhupada's books or teachings, then we have a problem. But if we find one that seems to apply, and we apply it and it works, well that's... Prabhupada was very pragmatic, as he said. So India has a way of... Um the statement that was made that India, if we do things the way if we live in more pukka like India, then maybe a lot of our circumstances that we're going through in this con in America will change. Um, then we have, we mentioned the cultural difference, and then we mentioned how in the beginning how Prabhupada is so loving, you know, accepting this, you know, and then and then the devotees would join, and afterwards, what principles that they have, you know, what what do they need to do to follow the standard to become a disciple? And then there's the point about Krishna House where it's so warm and so loving. And I experience this. This is something I'm, this question is part of experience because I see this at Krishna House where anyone that comes in, regardless of who they are, are giving an opportunity to make advancement from whatever level that they're on. And it's presented very, very simply. So how, does, how do we get, in, you know, with the progression of Kali Yuga and where we seem to be going as, you know, how do we bring that back in to really, I mean, because that that's seems to be a magnanimous point, start with that simplicity instead of all this, you know, other stuff. I mean, is it just because of Kali Yuga? Is, it, is America, I mean, is, is it hopeless in America? I mean, so what are some of the means to have that concept spread right across America so that we can have this, you know what I'm saying, my yes. question? Yes, yes. yes. It's the, uh, the, the Gita has these values. You know, one of our famous devotees in Oxford, Shona Parishi, who extracted six values from the Gita. Uh, so one of them is uh, Samadarshan. So Samadarshan means seeing everybody equally. Uh, applying that means that all kinds of kind of uh, institutionalized discrimination set aside. And, and we're so habituated to them, we don't see them as discriminatory practices, but the outsider, the newcomer, does. You know? So that, that's been one of our secrets at Krishna House. We just took a fresh look at the whole routine and just did away with things that are discriminatory. Uh, for example, uh, a simple example is when the prasad comes off the altar, you know, the e lamp. So uh, generally, we take to all the men first, right? And then first to the Yeah, first Prabhupada. Yes. But then after Prabhupada, then we take the men, we try to take it to the senior men. There's even a little cartoon. Okay. First you take it to the white Sikhas, and then the gray Sikhas, and then the brown Sikhas. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, so, so instead of this hierarchical and gender discrimination, we just said, okay, take it to whoever is closest after you take it to Prabhupada. And in a subtle way, that sends a message. It's the men, the women, the old, the young, it doesn't really matter. So that's an example of de, uh, you know, uh, culturalizing or over-culturalizing the, the experience of Krishna consciousness. If we look back, this is exactly how it was done in the early days of Islam. There was no sense of men, women, old, or younger, or you just everybody who was close to yeah. And these things are, are very radical. And most devotees, we can't even remember when it was like that. But that's what has worked with Krishna House. And that sort of consciousness that everybody is here as a sadhaka, as a respected devotee. Uh, my name is Karen. I'm a relatively new devotee. Uh, I apologize for being late. I was in the cow service. Um, from what I'm picking up on the conversation, and what I'm curious about giving these very nice questions, is how do you reckon the desire to advance and to become more pika, paka, paka, yeah? And how do we 
both strive for that, but also provide a supporting base for new devotees and not really trying to hold them to that standard or making them feel uncomfortable because they can't meet that standard or they don't understand it yet. And how do we deal with those um, kind of upsets? Like for me, I kind of really like the rigidity. I like the separation. I like the dress. I like the conservative nature of it. All of these things appeal to me. But I've seen as some other devotees that kind of come as karmis and kind of turn into devotees or aspire for that. I see they maybe struggle with this a little more. And not just them as individuals, but also as a community and some senior people who, you know, are aspiring for this Paka. And, and so maybe they're a little attached. They're like, maybe mm -hmm. me, it really fits my morals, so I really like it. Mm -hmm. um, so, but how do we also embrace the new people and teach them about Krishna and share this love of Krishna without making them feel uncomfortable and also not diminishing ourselves at mm -hmm. all in doing this? A good, good question. It goes back to the end. Oh, yeah, I think you wrote them right here. Uh, but we have to deal with ourselves first. That's the thing. If, if we're progressing in our Krishna consciousness, it's independent of whether anyone else is or isn't. Okay? So we can absolve or relieve ourselves of the requirement to evaluate others, unless that happens to be our particular service. See that each individual soul is unique, has a unique relationship with Krishna. And this is a mind blowing thing when you think about it. You know? Considering in one human body there's a hundred trillion living entities. Did you know? Mm. You know uh, ten, 10 trillion human cells and 90 trillion other uh, single fans or, mm. or uh, yeah. little entities waiting for the feast oh. you know, when, <laughs> when we die. So anyway, the point is each and every spirit soul has a unique relationship with Krishna, a unique way of pleasing Krishna. Isn't that amazing? I mean, isn't that a very godlike thing to do? You create countless living beings, each one empowered to please you in a particular way. <laughs> so, uh, coming to that point of realization, what is our particular service to Krishna? That's the journey of self-realization. Therefore, it behooves us not to worry about others' particular relationship with Krishna. We don't have to be evaluating theirs or comparing ours to them, to theirs, you see. If you're inclined towards a conservative approach, that's just an expression of your nature. If somebody else finds rigidity and rules and regulations off-putting, well, that's their particular nature. And there is room for everybody. Prabhupada said that uh, the, at the annual meeting of all the ISKCON leaders, you, the theme should always be unity and diversity. So that's our challenge, to be united and yet allow for the individual expression. So if somebody is very strict and enjoys it, that's fine, but they shouldn't impose it on others. And similarly, if somebody is very liberal, they shouldn't look down on somebody, ah, oh, you're so, such a rules and regulations person. So the, rather the principle is amani not manadena, not wanting respect from others, but willing to give all respect to others. So what it comes down to is a lot of patience and tolerance you know, allowing other people to express their devotion in their own way. Is that right? Yeah, indeed. But more specifically, like, um, for example, if we have someone that's coming to temple who doesn't dress appropriately, um, or whatever the temple determines to be appropriate dress, um, how would we deal with getting them to come to temple appropriately and still being able to share Krishna with them? This is the duty of, should be the duty of one person, and not everyone. You see, if, if somebody is not dressing appropriately and they're, and they're coming regularly, let's say, obviously if somebody's here as a casual visitor for the first time, are we really going to be making an issue about their dress and they're walking in the door for the first time? They have no clue. But let's say somebody's coming regularly. There should be one person whose duty it is to care for and instruct that person. What often happens is that everybody takes it upon themselves, and then the poor newcomer feels like he's descended to a planet of nitpickers. You know, everybody's going to tell me to do this, do this, do this. You know, it's, it's very distasteful. Again, it takes some intelligence and organization. Somebody should be in charge and 
everybody knows who that person is, the, the, the guest master, the trainer, whatever, and takes concerns to that person and not directly to them. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. well, um, one problem that we've had here historically is that because um, the teaching is that Lord Chaitanya's mercy should be available to everyone, as you're saying, um, then uh, there doesn't seem to be like much balance there often that, you know, just come on in and then the aftermath is like, oh wow, that the devotees aren't really being protected because um, things are end up being tolerated that shouldn't be tolerated and it's kind of like after the fact and so, um, I mean, it seems as though there has to be that balance, there has to be certain expectations and especially in our situation where we're this you know, big community, it's not like a Krishna house, you must have to have some uh, kinds of uh, you know, qualifications for somebody to like just move in. But here it doesn't seem so rigid. It's, it's just kind of like, you know, come on in. And then we just have to deal with all this like... Uh, mm -hmm. well, it's a little bit like, <clears throat> like uh, premarital counseling. You know, if issues are brought up in advance, before the fact, they're a lot easier to deal with than after the fact. So, uh, so we, we have a simple application for a person to fill out. Uh, yes, I agree to come to the morning program. Yes, I agree to follow regular principles. Yes, I agree to interact appropriately with the opposite gender. You know, these things are in, in, on an application and they sign their name. If they don't follow, we refer them to it. And if they can, won't follow, we, we ask them to leave. But it, it's not a lot. You, know, it's not, you have to uh, adapt the dress code, you have to adapt the hairstyle, you have to do all of these cultural things. That can come in. So that, that allows a person to come in and feel comfortable and feel like they're adding Krishna to their lives rather than radically trying to change themselves. Just adding Krishna. So I appreciate your point. And we've had that same problem. You know, because that our eagerness to see new people become devotees, we'll go, oh, all right, give them a chance. You know, but then they can create all kinds of havoc. So we try to refine it to the, the core issues and get those agreed upon in advance. It's much more about behavior norms you know, than, uh, <clears throat> than other things. I mean, we do the background check, but that's rarely a problem. It's just more, do you agree that you'll participate in the morning program five days a week? You'll, you'll be ready to do service when it's time to do it. So, and that service is quantified, so many hours a day is expected. You know, and there's also some flexibility in the schedule, so they're treated like adults. They have some time every day which they can explore Krishna consciousness or do things on their own without supervision. How many people live there? 35. I'm sorry. 35. 35. Oh, you have that much facility. It's packed up. <laughs> but this is the thing with this Samadarshan approach, it just keeps growing. It's been a lot of fun. Yeah. Thank you for your service. Thank you for yours. Very Krishna. Yeah, I wrote a book about Prabhupada when he first got here. Um, and uh, I found out he was very lean in person. Like each person he, he merited based on like maybe something called like situation ethics. He really didn't, wasn't too hard on people. He, he understood where they were coming from. So my question is, do you think we're making too big of a deal about Kali Yuga based on, we're just dealing with each other's karma? We're making too big a deal about Kali Yuga? Too, but based, you know, based on, you know, like, everyone's like so worried about where our uh, destiny is going as a people. Like as, as we progress into what, like a hundred thousand years, they said it's going to last. Or, mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I mean, uh, you think we're making too big of a deal about it based on the fact that th that's just the way it is, you know? Um, you know. Yeah, it's it's uh, it is situational. You know, again, uh, people should not be allowed to make decisions in the community, and and uh, you may have to sacrifice an individual to protect the village. So there are some responsibilities if you're, you're entering a community, some behavioral expectations. Um, but I agree with your point for making too big a deal about people's attachments, about their habits, 
prior Krishna consciousness were very, very clearly named destinations. If you're going to live in the ashram, you want to live in the community, then these are the expectations. And if you're not comfortable with those, we don't hate you, we don't condemn you, just stay outside and visit when you like. And then gradually come to that point. Am I answering the question? Yes, yeah. I, I do feel like, you know, if you wrote that book, you probably did see what I've seen. Probably was extremely liberal. Just encouraging people to add fish. All right. Are we going over time? We're all right? Uh, I guess so. If, no, if you need to leave, I'll, I won't be insulted for you. <clears throat> when Srila Prabhupada was being very liberal, most of the people that were coming in were young and strong. Uh, you know, despite whatever their problems and their virtues are, most of them were young and strong. Here, nowadays, you get a lot of sick people, you get a lot of old people, you get young people that need a lot of counseling. Which makes it even harder because uh, you know there, there's so much that you need to provide, and uh, in, in a lot of our, you know, in, 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 in the, the, the temple can only offer so much. So people have to be aware of that. Or well, we can't accomplish so, something like joining the military. You can't even join after a certain age because you, you're not, you can't really do what needs to be done. And you know you have to pass a certain health test. And you have to even pass certain academic tests. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Otherwise, you just you know you, you, you don't fit into the type of person that, that they can deal with. Mm -hmm. The same at each temple may be different. Some temples may have a lot more facility for dealing with certain types of people, and others may not. Yeah. Well, um, just answer this subjectively. My my experience is that if we take care of the people Krishna sends us. To the best of their ability, and I learned this from Dr. Maharaj also. You take care of the ones that he sends us, then he sends us more. Um, you know, we, instead of praying to the deities, uh, Krishna, please send us devotees, good mm -hmm. devotees. We can pray, Krishna, if you'll send us devotees, we promise to take care of them. Mm -hmm. So the quality is an issue, <clears throat> it's certainly an issue. Um, <clears throat> but if we give people a chance, the more we're able to give them a chance. But again, by very clear parameters, mm -hmm. you know, that, then uh, it's surprising who can become devotees. Mm -hmm. You know that story about Giriraj, Maharaj, and Kushikrata? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, so he's catatonic schizophrenic. He's, he wrote to Prabhupada, he's, when he creates a scene during the Sunday feast, we allow him to live in the temple, and Prabhupada wrote back, have you no compassion? Hmm. So this catatonic schizophrenic person became this great scholar, Kushi hmm. So, um, hmm. okay, maybe not quickly. Well, just a quick question, kind of regret, regressing back to things you were discussing earlier about uh, Kanishna Adhikari, Kukuma Adhikari, and so on. You also know the story of the South Indian Brahmin who was illiterate. Hmm. So his qualification of to become a scholar was pretty limited. So all the things we're talking about, the gradual process and so on, he probably couldn't even, maybe if he heard it from someone, he could understand it. But yet he was embraced by Lord Chaitanya. So uh, what, what did he have? that qualified him to be embraced by the Lord. And was he an Uttamati party? We need the Uttamati to tell, but, <laughs> <laughs> but he had so much love, this is what Lord Chaitanya saw, he had so much love of just looking at the Bhagavad Gita even upside down. And, yeah. So I'm thinking about how Krishna was driving his devotee and how kind Krishna was. Mm -hmm. There's another story <clears throat> in this regard that we can maybe relate with better, you know. Uh, Jayananda Prabhu was the one disciple of Sri Prabhupada who was canonized by Prabhupada, right? We observed his mm. uh, disappearance day every year. So, uh, mm. Jayananda Prabhu was not very good at Sanskrit. Mm. And uh, one year on his disappearance day, I was with Satsu, I mean, uh, Sridhar Maharaj and Tamal Krishna Maharaj. And Sridhar Maharaj said, Yes, 
Well, sometimes when I was with Jai Nanda, we'd sit down to say Gayatri, and after 30 seconds, he'd be pop, Papa. <laughs> and uh, so I asked him, uh, how do you chant Gayatri so fast? He said, frankly, I can't remember a word of it. <laughs> <laughs> and and Tamal Krishnamara then said, when I got my Gayatri from Prabhupada, Jai Nanda already had his second initiation, but he wanted to come for a refresher. And so we came together to Prabhupada's room in San Francisco. Prabhupada said, yes, all right. So he started with Jai Nanda. He repeated the first line. Now he repeated after me. Over and over and over again for about a half an hour. And finally Prabhupada smiled and said, it is hopeless. <laughs> <laughs> but because you are sincere, whatever you say, Krishna will accept. <laughs> so this is the, the, the qualification. Sincere desire to please is much more important than an academic qualification. If we have academic ability, great, we can use that to push them, but it's not the essence of it. Hmm. All right, any last? Uh, yes, Prabhu, uh, towards what Yogendra was saying, isn't it kind of our duty, even if we get low quality people, to try to engage them through service, just so that they can become purified and maybe even become qualified, useful? even if they're not like really strong or really smart or really able? Yes, as far as possible. If, if, if they're able to follow the principles and participate in the sadhana and chant Hare Krishna, then we can forgive a lot me on that. You know? And if they're trainable, you know, if, if they, if what they, does it mean? That means if they, if they make mistakes. You know that word. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> I have time to train people. <laughs> That created a disturbance. I'm, I'm sorry if I'm like harping on this, but we've had some really bad experiences with people creating a disturbance. It is. Um, I, I already remember one Yasa Puja uh, offering that I was in Prabhupada's uh, Yasa Puja book, I read a Shri Prabhu, and he used the phrase how he had in management so many decades, and he used the phrase how he had had to deal with devotees who were richly ornamented with idiosyncrasies. <laughs> so believe me, you know, I, I, we've had our share of those and more. It's just, um, I'm in a cycle of Jagatapa Maharaj, and I, I feel like you know, there are maybe few people on the planet that are more compassionate than he, but he's also a great protector of Prabhupada's mm -hmm. Iskhan and the devotees. So I just really feel strongly about that there has to be that balance there. And what you described about, you know, like the expectations coming in, you know, that has to be, like, yeah. that has to there's be the... In writing, in advance. And then if there's some deviation from that, just remind them. And if it continues to say, sorry, you can't honor your agreement. Yeah. But, but those parameters should be, you know, limited. Not, not 12 cantos. Because <laughs> yeah. <laughs> what is... Because... See, if we read about Prabhupada's early life, how tolerant he was, you know, how he just let things slide and let them slide and let them slide for weeks and months and years in some cases. And then, you know, like, if I told you all the rules, you would faint. He just, like the first deity installed, the Lord Jagannath in San Francisco, the whole puja program was, all right, light a candle and twirl around a few times and then pass it on to whoever else is in there. Audience. And that was the whole Pujari program. And so he, he was very, very tolerant and accommodating. And it also behooves us to, to do that. So it's a very, it's a fine line, but that's, those are the parameters that we use. We found it that it has worked really well. But we do get, still get people who we give a chance to and they create a disturbance. But we, you know, we just learned, okay, at this point, you get a warning, and if it happens again, you have to leave. Just don't let them use your address <laughs> for getting their mail. Then by law, you have to give them 30 days. <laughs> That's how it works in Florida? Yeah. I think it's yeah. No, here's a little bit different. They stay for uh, three three days. Then, you know, you got to give them, uh, you got to nail a notice on their door and then bring it down to the courthouse where oh, they'll yeah. issue a summons. If the person's going to make a big deal out of it That's and refuse it. We were talking about this before. Uh, I think it was Alan Minifer who said something to the newspaper. I'm not sure he says 
that Prophet was from the conservative wing. Of, and then Prophet heard that and he didn't like it at all. It's 90% liberal. <laughs> It just, it just looks quite conservative. Right? Mm -hmm. yeah. um, Prabhupada's treatment of women was revolutionary. And he got criticized for it. And he said, these people who are criticizing me, they'll just have to be satisfied with their own foolishness. Because they can't do anything to spread Christian consciousness. Mm -hmm. How do you deal with the uh, gay issue? Um, <clears throat> openly. And the same rules apply to gay people, apply to everybody else. So we don't we encourage people to be honest about their sexuality. And, um, they may take extra counseling, especially if they're living in ashrams. When they take that extra uh, special counseling? When? When? Where? Well, that's no. I mean, from the leaders, from the okay. ashram leaders. You know, this is yeah. We don't want predators, but we also. Don't discriminate. Mm -hmm. So um, you, you have like a dormitory situation? Yeah. Yeah, you know, um, Shrema Prabhupada's early disciples were gay. Mm -hmm. And he, you know, he didn't make anything, any big deal about it. Until they made a big deal. Mm -hmm. <laughs> mm -hmm. But it, from his point of view, he didn't discriminate. Do you remember in the Lilamita, Raphael and Dan, was it Don and Raphael? Oh, yeah. His two hippies were living in the storefront smoking pot and, and uh, probably tolerated and tolerated. Even when he would report, they, they, uh, the other boy said, well, he's, he's smoking pot in the temple. And, and Prabhupada said to tell him if he does it again, he'll have to leave. But he made excuses for him and he tolerated him. And that was the move. Uh, that, that, he sh that worked. That was the point. That's when the temples were all flourishing and growing. You know, there was a great deal of acceptance like that and, and tolerance. So we're established now, but can, can we also retain that or remove that? I remember in the early days, uh, the women used to wash all the clothes of the men who mm -hmm. were friends. We, in the 73, 74, it That's wasn't the oldest, we were the mothers. But we were friends that were, you know, brothers and sons and, and everything was more acceptable. Yes. And we didn't have rules when I lived outside when I was 15 years old. But we, mm. when I came, I had to follow exactly, you know, the principles. I mean, we were not allowed to go to service and then we followed. Mm. But we were so friendly mm -hmm. and everything was just flowering. Yes. And, and we... Everything flourished at this. Sangita flourished, people came and visited. She the Papa went to Venezuela, he loved it. But we were still in that mood. Everything yeah. was so happy. See, that, that mood is still a tame loss with the non local people. It's just kind of like pointing out we really have uh, discovered a Christian house. So, to be very honest, you just treat women nicely. Mm -hmm. And, and that, that just balances the scales, and then and that flourishing takes place. That's eventually what we found. Mm -hmm. All right. So it's a real pleasure to be here. Can I say a quick word? Yeah. Uh, I have some books. Anyone would like copies, please let me know. These are new books by Kyle Hunter from Oak. Bhagavad Gita and Rap. For the share of Bhagavad Gita with any young people that might be used to it. Welcome to have copies. I have some for everyone. How much do you? Take them as a gift for your donor everyone. Yeah, that's it. Thank you very much, Shiva Prabhupada. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.